Over the years, the World Bank has come to recognize the potential importance of extractives for development. As the world looks beyond fossil fuels, the World Bank too is having to adapt. We talked to Christopher Sheldon, who leads their work on extractives. Christopher, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. You lead the bank's agenda on extractives. Um, let me ask you a very direct question. Um, are the extractives good or bad for development? Well, I think they're good for development. That's why I work in the, the sector. But um, there's a lot of ongoing negative impacts that need to be really well managed environmentally, but also socially. So for me, the answer is yes, but it depends a lot how you go about managing the sector. And, and that's why I think it's important to actively manage um, the sector, not just sort of let it happen. When you look at extractives from, a, from an economic or a global economic point of view, there seems to be two conflicting groups. You have, on the one hand, community consumers who benefit from low commodity prices, and then you have commodity producers who benefit from high commodity prices. How do you solve this conundrum? Prices go up and down, so there's always sort of temporary winners and, and losers in, in that process. And usually those things come to somewhat of an equilibrium over, mm. over time where you know there's the right supply of minerals that we need but at prices that allow governments and communities to get good benefits and companies to get a good return is, is, is the right balance. Mm. That's pretty difficult to achieve um, but over you know cyclical nature of the industry I think that's uh, that's what happens. There are people now that are predicting a downturn in, in the economy. How do you see that will affect uh, the industry? Yeah, I know the World Bank and IMF recently sort of revised their global um, economic outlook with mm. a, a slightly um, lower growth forecast. So I think that does have an impact on, um, on demand for, for commodities. But overall, what we've seen is that there's a fairly robust demand for minerals. It's, it's changing a little bit. Um, I mean, so you mean changing which commodities are in demand? Certain commodities mm. are in demand. So I, I do think that we are going to see a shift. Um, you know, what the World Bank's own, own view on this is that we'll have a transition in the types of minerals that, mm. that are important to the world. So we'll see commodity prices rise in some of those and, and perhaps fall in, in, in others. Um, you know, there's a, the way we look at it and from the research we've done, is that the, the world of the future, a lower carbon world, is much more mineral intensive than the world of today. So over time, we think that um, you know, indicates that prices would be you know, robust over the longer term, but there'll always be some fluctuations. Um, certainly the, the slight slowdown in the growth of China, who's been a big driver in um, you know, demand for commodities, that has, a, has an impact. But we're seeing growth in, in other places. Mm. And uh, so I think that serves well for the, for the mining industry and for the countries that have those minerals. I want to dig a little bit deeper into the energy transition, um, moving away from fossil fuels. What do you do when it comes to energy transition? The World Bank has a, a target um, for what we call climate co-benefits. Uh, and so for my department, which is energy and extractives, mm. we want 70% of our lending to have climate co-benefits. That means that it, it should do something positive for the climate, if I can put it like that. So that's a real focus for us. So mm. on the energy side, and I, I manage the extractors, but there's a strong link, of course, to energy. Right. There's a big focus on renewable energy, on energy efficiency. Um, you know, we still also do other things, transmission lines, sector reforms, other, other things that are, that are not tied ex directly to that. When it comes to the mining sector, we're really trying to, to see how we can bring in renewable energy uh, into the mining uh, areas. You know, there's a lot of mines out there that are fairly remote. Um, they run off diesel generators because that's you know, independent and fairly reliable for the, for the company. But what if you know, the fact that there's a mine there allowed us, or even better if there's maybe two or three mines, allowed us to have, have an independent power producer come in and build you know, a hydro um, electric scheme that would service all three mines, but another 200,000 people that live in the area. Mm. So we, we would not necessarily have the resources to just come and build that, but if we can leverage the demand from those mines, we can bring in energy there that could benefit not just those mines, but a lot of other, other people. Um, it's been about four or five years since we did a, a real detailed study on that called Power of the Mine. And we looked at Africa and we, we modeled that in different countries. And you can have cleaner, 
cheaper energy that services the mines and also then can you know, power all the communities around there. Mm. That's easier said than done in, in practice, uh, but we're also trying the same sort of thing with um, uh, solar power uh, to try to you know, have that in remote areas that would help power a mine, but also feed in then to the, to the grid um, you know, around those mines. So you know, we're trying to integrate that even directly into the, the mining sector work, but I think there's a long way to go there, to be honest. I think that's an area where also the industry is really looking hard. How do they um, lower their carbon footprint mm how do they save money on power, but they need to make sure they have reliable power uh, and that, you know, so we would need to work together. I think this is a good example of where, you know, governments and private sector and, you know, development partners like the World Bank can really work together to try to bring those sorts of solutions. Mm. And they're all also walking away from coal. Um, yeah, so we haven't financed coal since 2010. Exactly, um, yeah, well, I was we have that a, too. Yeah, we yeah, have a fairly strict <laughs> policy on coal um, and we yeah, are, are unlikely to, to ever be financing that mm. again and I don't see that happening you know, in the future at all. So we have a much bigger push you know, on uh, cleaner energy. In, in fact, just recently we launched a, uh, a special campaign on battery storage. We're actually raising a, a billion dollars to put towards battery storage because we think that's one of the, um, the obstacles of, you know, for um, you know, wide, scale, wide scale sort of solar and, and wind is the, the lack of storage. Mm. So if we can actually crack that and, and um, you know, bring in more battery storage and help um, lower the prices of that, that will really help accelerate the use of those renewable energies um, you know, globally. So that's a, another big push of ours. But that also brings you back to the mineral side because you need minerals for those batteries. So it kind of comes back into what I started talking about earlier, you know, the role that um, developing countries have in providing you know, the minerals that go into these sorts of technologies. Tell me about the concept climate smart mining. Yes, that's um, a real new thrust of ours. Um, it comes from a couple of different sides. We, we know that um, more minerals are needed for clean energy technologies. And we want to make sure that the right supply of minerals is there so that there's no hindrance really in the adoption of those technologies. And technologies change and mm. the kind of minerals that go into those technologies will also change. So we can't exactly predict everything that will happen and which minerals will be used. But overall, um, despite whatever technology changes are there, it's clear to us that you'll need a lot more minerals than you need today. So that's the first part. But we also want to make sure developing countries have access to those markets and can participate in supplying that. You know, there have been concern raised from some um, manufacturers about the source of their minerals and we don't want developing countries to, to miss out on the opportunities because there's concerns that those sources of minerals are, you know, for example, involving child labour or environmental impacts that are negative. Um, so we, we want to help countries address those sorts of issues so that um, you know, they are seen as responsible uh, suppliers of, of, of the minerals. But there's also then the carbon intensity of manufacturing minerals them, themselves. That's something that hasn't been a lot of attention paid to. But you know, if you take a, a, a car today, um, you know, most of the emissions come from the fuel. But if you have an electric car, well, most of the emissions will come from mining the materials that go into making the car. So then it starts to uh, you know, raise questions about, well, how green is the supply of those minerals? So we also want to play a role in lowering the carbon uh, footprint of the mining process. We, we'd love to uh, partner with industry in doing that, industry meaning the mining industry, the auto industry, the tech industry, mm. um, because you know, we, we think that's important for the planet. You know, if we're going to be producing the amount of minerals that we think uh, are needed, we also need to lower the carbon intensity of that, that production. So we want to learn from the innovation that's happening. We'd like to have, make sure that innovation is shared so that other companies can adopt those same sort of approaches. And for our work with the governments, we'd you know, like to develop the right kind of policies that will encourage that sort of behaviour. So climate smart mining sort of encompasses all of that. It's uh, you know, the, you know, the impact on forests of mining and trying to minimise that the use of water in mining, the sources of energy that go into mining. Uh, all of that is all part of climate smart mining for mm. us. So in a nutshell, it's, I would say, making sure that you know, the right minerals uh, are produced that the world needs, but in a more sustainable way. I, I sort of call it, and I think the job of the World Bank in, in mining is really about resources for a sustainable mm. future. 
Let me just tie it back to what you were talking about in the beginning um, about volatility mm -hmm. and the difficulties of managing that for governments. And some people say that with, well, for example, lithium, there might mm. be even more volatility and more difficult to manage. Um, how do you prepare government or how do you help governments be prepared yeah. uh, for that? No, that's a very good question. And that's sort of why you might have heard me sort of hesitate on, you know, sort of hedge a little bit on the types of minerals because mm. lithium, for sure, at the moment, at the moment, yes. Everybody's excited about lithium because mm. of uh, battery storage for vehicles and, and you know, for the power sector. Um, our own, that you know, report I talked about, about the role of minerals in low carbon economy, predicted uh, a thousand percent increase in the use of lithium. And that was probably an underestimate because you know, we think that that market will, will actually grow. But yeah, technology could change and it could be a different structure. So yeah, that's, that's a tough one, but that's true for all sorts of, of, of commodities. There's ways for governments to help manage volatility. Sovereign wealth funds, for example, you know, putting aside money from the good times for the bad times. Mm. I also think having a diversified um, mineral sector, or a, more importantly, a diversified economy, is Im important for managing volatility. So I think all of those things are things that governments should be doing, not just putting everything behind you know, one technology or one type of commodity. In the past, people were looking for copper and gold and, and but now I find that the government's saying hey I've got graphite or I've got lithium or I've got rare earths so, so there's a lot more interest in a, in a wider variety of minerals and countries are realizing that they have all of those minerals so it's not just large-scale bulk mining it can be more niche mining and all of those sorts of parts of the sector are important and that adds to some diversification um, but in, you know, in terms of a broader diversification of the economy yeah you want to take that money from the times that are good and invest it back into human capital, invest it back into infrastructure, because if things change, you want to have some lasting benefits from, um, from you know, the use of the resources. Opportunities and challenges as always. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you.